From the Center for Investigative Reporting and PRX, this is Reveal. I'm Al Letson. This is Chapter 3 of American Rehab, A Venomous Snake. Last time, we started telling you about the first nationally recognized drug rehab. It was called Synanon and founded by a charismatic guy named Charles Dietrich. We can take credit for literally getting thousands and thousands and thousands of people off of crippling addictions, fatal addictions. We have done that. We've done it here. By the late 60s, Synanon was widely respected with a national presence and a celebrated treatment program. It had intake centers in cities all over the country and commune-style rehabs. They had improved the lives of many people, including John Stallone. I was grateful. I still am. Saved my life, man. You know, I wouldn't be who I am. After claiming to have found a cure for drug addiction, Synanon got more ambitious. Could it tackle other problems in society? We are an experimental society. I don't know how this is going to come out. I really don't. If I knew how it was going to come out, I wouldn't do it. This was the golden era of experimental societies, what the rest of us might call cults. Synanon started recruiting people who weren't addicted to join its ranks. It promised a new life for recruits, full of all work and no pay. For those at the top like Chuck, Synanon delivered a lush lifestyle. The asshole that's doing all the work, of course, doesn't get any of the pay. That's the way it is all over the world. The people who do the work don't get the, they don't get paid for it. That's too bad. I'm glad that the world is full of such assholes. It leaves more for me. No, I'm quite serious. I'm quite serious. Chuck stumbled onto a lucrative model. If you don't pay wages or taxes, you could make a lot of money. Why should anyone help Synanon? Well, the most obvious answer to that is they might save a life. After all, Synanon had been founded to save the lives of people addicted to drugs. But as it careened towards madness, Synanon might take a life. Our team, led by Shoshana Walter, Laura Starcheski, and Ike Shree Skandaraja, have been investigating work-based rehab and its connection to Synanon for more than a year. Ike has the rest of the Synanon story. Okay, so John Stallone, the guy who left the narcotic farm in Lexington, Kentucky, and landed at Synanon, starting off as a milk sniffer, he made a life at Synanon. He got married to a woman he met there, had a kid, all while staying sober. And he got promoted to a new job. And then Chuck came up with a new system. He said, Synanon is growing topsy-turvy, so we're going to have to start what we're going to call a newcomer department. John's new job was to head up the newcomer department at Synanon HQ in Santa Monica. Because there's so many people at this point. Thousands. 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 John told me that some of Synanon's Department of Hustlers, that's what they called the people who would scrounge up donated food, were now basically full-time recruiters. They were going around the country to any city with a serious drug problem to get the word out. Synanon will fly you for free to one of our facilities to treat your addiction. At this point, the rehab on the beach had expanded way beyond the beach. And how many properties are there? Tomales, the ranch, and Walker Creek. This is just all up in Marin. Marin County, just north of San Francisco. Then San Diego, Santa Monica, Detroit, Oakland, San Francisco, New York, Puerto Rico. Uh, So there was a lot of facilities. So many facilities that there was even room for an entire new class of people entering Synanon. Hi. Hello, please come in. Hey. My name is Lynn. Come on upstairs. I'll go get Phil. How are we... doing? Nice, nice to, to meet, meet you. you. Lynn and Phil are now white haired grandparents living in a Seattle suburb. In the 60s, they were both living in the San Francisco Bay Area, where they were going to a lot of the same parties, but really, they couldn't have been more different. I was not going to end up well. You know, I was promiscuous, and I was uh, you know, sl- uh, sleeping with anything that walked, and I would not enjoy any of it. Well, Phil was, let's say, shy. I was one of the few people who managed to make it all the way through UC Berkeley in the, in the 60s and was still a virgin at 
at age 23. <laughs> so in the late 60s, Lynn was a public school teacher in Oakland and Phil the CFO of a ballot counting company. They started going to Synanon game clubs for squares. I had round corners, but I was still a square. <laughs> do, you, do you both self-identify as squares? Oh, yeah. It's still crazy as hell, but still squares. <laughs> we even were identified by Synanon as squares. <laughs> Neither of them were addicted to drugs, hence the square status. Still, they were disenchanted with the direction of their lives and the direction of the country. It was a pretty crazy time in the United States. You know, civil rights struggle, the Vietnam War heating up. And here was something that was um, more positive than the United States policy at the time. As the posters that hung on the walls of Synanon promised, today is the first day of the rest of your life. The big draw was the game. And I think that that was the buzz that set this going. You can hear Synanon games sometimes uh, all the way across the street. We've had neighbors complain about the language used in the Synanon game. The game that we told you about in the last chapter, it started off as this revolutionary drug therapy. It was designed to tear down defenses and expose truths about addiction and your own perceptions of yourself. But now it was evolving into this cultural phenomenon. Synanon was hosting game clubs in big cities as a way to draw in squares like Lynn, middle-class professionals who were now playing the game partly as a form of group therapy and partly as a parlor game. The game offered uh, stuff you couldn't buy, tremendous humor, a genius language, you know, language under pressure and attack. There's nothing like it. But I should say, not all the new players found it useful. And it was fun. I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there you go. You hated it? Hated it. For Lynn, the game offered an emotional release. But for others, like Phil, it gave him an emotional black eye. I looked at the game as the price you paid to get everything else. <laughs> I, I guess the, the main draw for me at the time was that we were doing almost everything in life differently. We did sex differently. We did eating differently. We did education differently. We did medicine differently. It was a phenomenally interesting place. So, like Synanon leader Chuck Diedrich said, experimental society. One thing about communal living it means lots of intimate aspects of life are known by and influenced by the community. And since Phil brought up relationships, let's talk about it. When Lynn met Phil for the first time, she was already going steady with another square inside Synanon. But she caught Phil's eye, they started talking, they had a leisurely meal in a Synanon dining room, they sat at the bar without any booze, and Lynn started to get the feeling that she was into Phil. But before she could tell her boyfriend that she wanted to see someone else, she stepped into a game. One where other players had already seen her have this flirtatious meal with Phil. So they laid into her. It was the most gossipy parts of life institutionalized. First, the squares just start playing the game and going home. Then... The squares wanted to move in. Candy Latson and other longtime residents like him saw the group they had helped build change before their very eyes. Treating addiction had brought Synanon fame, and now Chuck was capitalizing on it. Admitting squares brought in new resources and new expertise. I remember when Milt, look at his last name, this is what really set Synanon up. Milt was Milt Cooper, a square who had moved into a Synanon house in San Diego. Milt had been in the advertising and promotions business, and as the story goes, Chuck challenged Milt in a game about his commitment to Synanon. And Milt left out of the group, went to the Lincoln in his glove compartment, came back with some papers and turned over the company to Synanon. 
Milt's business that he turned over to Synanon used a hot stamping machine to press a company's name on pens and pencils. Before this, work at Synanon was mostly about subsistence, cooking, cleaning, procuring rotten food. But now, Synanon was entering a real business. The business is providing companies with promotional items bearing their corporate symbols. Making a lot of money has always been a goal of Synanon's reclusive founder, Chuck Diedrich. One way I've always thought of, of Synanon is, is, a, is an American money-making concern. It's a business. We had crews, and you go into somebody's office and had this film, they show the film, and you could get a pencil, a lighter, a card with your name and company and da-da-da-da-da on it. And they went from Santa Monica to New York to all over. And ended up being the largest customer of the Schaefer and Parker pen companies. The best sales people were former addicts because they were used to living by their wits and they were high verbal. And they had a great compelling story to tell and were quite, uh, quite persuasive. And it was a real art. They were very successful at telling their dope fiend stories and describing how without Synanon they might be outside breaking into the business owner's car. <laughs> <laughs> By subtle threat or artful sales, the novelty business was humming, bringing in serious revenue Unrestrained by taxes or wages, by the mid-70s, Synanon was doing over $5 million a year in sales. That's like $24 million a year today. Meanwhile, donations kept rolling in. We were, you know, largely supplied by big donations of all kinds of different stuff. Dutch Boy Paint Company, National Ed Company, gave us an entire city block in San Francisco that they got a tax deduction for. John Stallone says the Department of Hustlers kept wrangling bigger and better donations. Uh, then we had a, a crew of good hustlers, and these guys would go to, like, uh, Oklahoma, Kansas, Texas, and hustle beef on the hoof. And then hustle slaughterhouses in the same town, and then hustle refrigerated train cars and send one car to San Francisco, another car to L.A. And now we're getting, like, top-of-the-line food, real good stuff. The Department of Hustlers was so productive, they started distributing their surplus donations to other nonprofits nearby. Food to the Black Panthers and New Balance sneakers to Jim Jones and his People's Temple. Speaking of hustling, boy, I'm telling you, it's really something. We're going to run a billion dollars worth of stuff through our, our, our books in, in, in like five years from now, in, in one year. A billion dollars. We're, we're going to make the community chest and goodwill all together look like a little Sunday school garage sale or something. It's, 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 God, it's going to be incredible. And did you ever wonder, like, when you're at one of the Synanon properties, like, how does the money all work? You're not getting paid minimum wage, are you? $50 a month. Do you know, if, is, is that legal? That's a good question. Eventually, the IRS would want to know more about Synanon's finances. Synanon has assets of $30 million. In its main lodge is its stock center, where careful tabs are kept on investments. It is its tax-free status and its business success that has produced some of the criticism. The world can't support all the assholes uh, uh, the way I want to be supported. Uh, not very many people know how to live like I do. They don't. They don't know how to be rich. It takes a long time. And that's how all that money start coming into Synanon. And that's what ruined Synanon. Because when the squares move in, Chuck used to just make what I would call dope fiend decisions, and we understood it. But now, the world that we was trying to get away from was now in Synanon, and the thinking and actions was like the squares in the world that we had left. We wanted to live in the world we had created at Synanon. In the fall of 1967, 
Candy decided to leave the world that they had created. He packed up his bag and left Sinanon. And I was not going to see Chuck. There was nowhere in the world. Because I know if I went to see Chuck, I wasn't going nowhere. Because hmm. Chuck was a master. And he could say three words, and I'd start crying, and I wouldn't go no fucking way. Hmm. I was not going to see him, because I wanted to go. Shit, I'd been there over seven years. When I got off the plane in New York, it was October 26th. Chuck had called a meeting, and he said, I lost a friend today. Candy got an opportunity to help build up a new rehab in New York, based on Synanon. And was it similar to Synanon? Yeah, it was the same thing. Synanon had come a long way since it was the best-known drug rehab in the country. It had inspired an entire second wave of rehabs based on its ideas. And more were coming. So, to remain relevant, the organization doubled down on their new mission, solving the intractable problems of human existence through social experiments. But this new direction produced new problems. And that's when it got all fucked up. So long as Synanon dealt only with drunks and drug addicts, its only real problems were with people who didn't want Synanon centers in their neighborhoods. But now its wealth and its radical social experimentation have produced much new criticism. Criticism that would only intensify. After the break, how Synanon the Rehab turned into Synanon the Religion. This is Reveal. From the Center for Investigative Reporting and PRX, this is Reveal. I'm Al Letson. We continue with Chapter 3 of American Rehab, A Venomous Snake. Got another five hours to talk about Synanon 1 to Synanon 2. It was a whole changing of the whole concept of Synanon. Synanon was founded to help guys like John Stallone beat their addictions and graduate to life outside the program. But it wasn't working. In its first decade, only 65 people graduated from Synanon. 65 That's a graduation rate of less than 1%. Others were able to stay off drugs, too, but only by staying inside Synanon. So eventually, founder Chuck Diedrich decided that was okay. He said, you know, you can't graduate from Synanon. He said, it's a lifetime deal. Synanon got cocky and wanted to be more than just the most prominent drug rehab in the nation. And the wild things that happened next could fill an entire Netflix series. Reveals, Ike Shree's Kandaraja tells us what happened. As Synanon reached from rehab to social movement, the goalposts moved with it. You don't graduate from a movement. And that was fine for John. He loved Synanon. He was staying off drugs, had a family, a job, and his life had improved so much from those days when he was robbing drugstores and hiding out from the cops in Brooklyn. That is, until Chuck implemented another rule that John just couldn't stomach. They had came to the decision that dope fiends were a bad influence on their children. So what we're going to do is, eventually all the children from here are going to be taken up to Tomales Bay, and you would be able to go visit them, you know, a couple times a year. Our our worst problem might very well be removed. Uh, That is the parent. Yeah. Oh, the worst thing that can happen to a child is that, that it has to have a parent, literally. Uh, so, so no more visiting, man. I want to look at my kid through a mirror. I went upstairs and I told my wife, I said, Judy, I said, I was just in the game, man, like, you know, and I'm not going to do that. In 1972, John decided it was time for his family to leave Synanon. I was gone. I was disillusioned. Lots of other people were disillusioned, too. In 1972, Synanon was at its apex, with 1,700 current residents. But no one knew how far it was about to fall, and how far Chuck was willing to push his vision of utopia. I didn't know that it was going to turn into a fucking hellhole. 
I didn't know it was gonna turn into what the fuck it did. Our dumb parents won't let their children alone. Of course, the one thing is they're not their children, mm -hmm. they're mine. It wasn't an open society anymore. It was a closed society. Some of the people with addictions were getting squeezed out, but dedicated squares like Lynn and Phil Ritter decided to stay. You know, it was it was articulated that we're done with the dopamine business. We have had so many other organizations copy their programs on Synanon that there's no need for us to be in that business anymore. And we have a new business to be in, which is trying new social, you know, experiments. Sequestering children from their parents made John want to leave. But many of the social experiments were both benign and authoritarian. Like when Chuck decided he couldn't smoke anymore, Synanon banned cigarettes for everybody. Now is the time to quit smoking. They lost a lot of people over that rule. And when Chuck's wife got diabetes... Now is the time to quit using sugar. If you don't like it, beat it. The first time my gut went off was when we were told that we were not going to have sugar anywhere in the, in the community anymore. In fact, we were not supposed to eat anything with sugar in it outside the community, like no more going out to get ice cream. And it was almost like Diedrich was saying, like, I wonder if he'll go for this bullshit. Well, no, you can't eat what you want. No, that's the whole problem. That's the whole problem. You can't do it. Chuck was comfortable losing people who didn't want to live by his rules. And the ones who stayed were the most devoted. Lois, you've been at Synanon for 15 years. Where do you place this head shaving in importance? Head shaving was once a sign of penitence, like when John Stallone confessed to being high and they shaved his head. Now it was becoming a sign of devotion. This is the second most important thing that has happened in Synanon. Our founder, Chuck Dieterich, said it was, and I just have to trust because this man is such an amazing person. He saw it when it happened that we were ready for it. I, I think it was more like a, an egg in a, in a pot of boiling water. It happened gradually, where you just kind of violated yourself. What came next could also be seen as a profound act of devotion, or if you're sitting on management, a clever tax dodge. In 1974, as the IRS was starting to look into the charitable nature of the organization, Synanon declared itself a religion. There was nothing particularly religious about any of the customs or practices that I was aware of after we had filed the papers. You know, right from the get-go, it was kind of, ha-ha, we get to do this to deal with the IRS, but we're going to consider the game our religious ritual. So the game was elevated to sacrament. Some residents were true believers, but the top Synanon lawyers, they were more clear-eyed about the maneuver. I also thought that, that religions, once they get to a certain point in this country, have enormous survival value. I mean, you just, when people come along and say, you can't keep uh, you know, sitting around in, in rooms and calling each other motherfuckers, and you say, well, that's my religion. They say, oh, 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 okay, uh, I understand that. I mean, if I were one of Synanon's lawyers and I had to lay out my plan to avoid taxes, I'd try to turn off the tape recorder first. One of the reasons that we're pushing this thing right now is because we may want to uh, shut off our books from inspection by government agencies and people that we don't like. That would make it a bit more difficult for the IRS to impose taxes upon us. Then uh, we, we may be able to, to set up certain walls around Senegal which make it more difficult to fuck with us. This is when the rehab entered its third and final chapter, the Church of Synanon, where Chuck ascended from founder and CEO to God. The basic problem on this planet is very simple. It's too many people. And as God, he sought to control life itself. This meant the end of children being born at Synanon. They were planning on doing vasectomies 
that following weekend on a lot of kids who were just 18. Which brings us to some of the weirdest tape I've ever heard. This is a recording from Synanon's closed-circuit radio broadcast. It's called The Wire. 7.45, you're listening to gaming in uh, the vasectomy stew. I was asked for a name. Vasectomy yeah. stew. This <laughs> cheery, drive-time radio host would broadcast excerpts of a perpetually running game known as the stew, where, in this case, the committed extolled the virtues of getting vasectomies. Hence, the vasectomy stew. Does the new person who's more enthusiastic about a vasectomy deserve to have one before the old-timer who's delayed for a year? They'd play recaps of arguments between old-timers and newcomers fighting over who would get to have their vasectomy first. Rick acquiesced with style and grace and let Andre get on the list before him. That was the outcome. And these broadcasts would get piped into each and every Synanon residence across the country. It all had the feel of communist-style propaganda. But what you don't hear on The Wire was the extreme pressure and intimidation exerted over those who resisted. You know, in the game, I took the position that, number one, I wasn't going to do it. And number two, I thought that Synanon was wrong to make people do it. And what did Charles Diedrich say? Never talk to him about it personally, because I had a hunch that he would probably be persuasive enough to get me to change my position. He was that compelling. He could be. We seem to be terrified as a people has never been terrified by anything that is strange. Now, uh, I don't know why this is. Phil was revolted by what was happening, of what Sinanon was turning into. So he stepped off the compound, went around Chuck's back, and sought help from local law enforcement, thinking they would be able to help stop this madness. The sheriff said, let me get this right. You want me to stop Sinanon from performing uh, voluntary vasectomies on people who are over 18 years old who want to have the operations. That's what you want me to do, right? And he kind of made a joke out of it. And when I was there, the sheriff called Synanon and said, I have one of your residents here who is telling me this story Is it true? And they confirmed that it was true and told the sheriff to tell me that I was not welcome to go back. Let me give you a rundown on the last day's events. About 9.40... Among testimonials of the benefits of having vasectomies and news of people leaving in droves, this call from the Marin County Sheriff's Office was actually mentioned over the Synanon wire in a news briefing that went out that day. And then a few minutes later, Richie Gross informed the stew that Phil Ritter was on the phone. So called from the Marin County Civic Center, informing us that he was going to seek an injunction for, as he saw it, stopping Synanon from putting people in that terrible bind to be clipped or to leave. In the end, Phil's plea for help failed. And the operations went on as planned. Do you mean all? We're all done in two days. They had seven doctors all doing vasectomies, one every 15 minutes. Eventually, over 200 men stepped out of vasectomy stews and into makeshift operating rooms. The thing that I I feel the worst about in Synanon in, in six years was there were a number of people who were already pregnant expecting to have their babies in Synanon. And one of them was almost at full term and was told that she needed to abort or not be able to live there anymore. And she and her husband uh, had an induced stillbirth, had a, basically had a nine-month abortion. It's really hard to imagine the kind of pressure that would lead people to make that decision. But I guess you have to picture living in a totally encompassing place where you don't have a life outside. In Synanon, 
skepticism had been removed, and compliance over the remaining was total. Sinan could have, could have been a great place. And it, it, I think that we, we flunked many moral tests. Some were just complicit, and others were actively enabling the madness of Chuck Diedrich. Are you friends with some of these people still? I don't talk much to either the lawyers or the doctors because I think that the doctors probably should have lost their licenses and that the lawyers should have been disbarred. Sinanon was taking a much darker, menacing tone. A Time magazine article labeled them a kooky cult, and that's an insult Chuck did not take lightly. Afterwards, in a television interview, he looked straight at his interviewer and invoked his loyal following against the magazine. Synanon has many, many thousands of friends who uh, have been helped by a Synanon, whose friends and relatives have been helped by a Synanon, and uh, uh, I, I don't know what those people might do. Uh, and I have no way of being responsible uh, for it. Uh, bombs could be thrown into odd places. That's too bad. That's too bad. Uh, I would certainly not institute anything like that, but I have no way of, of preventing it if it would happen. The people at Time Life will undoubtedly consider that a thinly veiled threat. I, if, if they can consider it a thinly veiled threat, that's their problem. I think it's kind of decent of me to warn them. In this increasingly paranoid, violent atmosphere, Phil left the Synanon house with nothing. He wasn't allowed to return, no suitcase, no goodbyes. He's just out. Lynn, on the other hand, stayed. She even spoke out in a game in support of vasectomies. When Phil was excommunicated, he was still okay with having his young daughter raised there. But he wanted to be able to visit her more. Well, oh gosh. We were in the middle of a custody battle. And, um... I had just, I was kind of out of my mind during this period of my life. Um, there was a lot of talk in Synanon about Phil being a splitty and um, dangerous. And I, um, our daughter Miriam was three. This part's a little messy to understand. But Lynn gave full custody of their child to Phil. Then she changed her mind. On one of Lynn's visitation days, she picked up their daughter from preschool, as was the plan, and without permission, without warning, she took her back to Sinanon. This quasi-kidnapping spooked Sinanon's leaders, and their solution was to get Lynn and her daughter a plane ticket to a Sinanon safe house in New York. Watching myself put my life into a pencil sharpener, I was just shredding my life. And I said, you could do better than this. Almost anybody could do better than this. But for Synanon, the days of doing better had come to an end. By 1976, Synanon had amassed a large stockpile of weapons and ammunition and trained a paramilitary group that it called the Imperial Marines. They'd already attacked neighbors living near Synanon's main compound in Marin County, California. Now... Anyone who opposed Sinanon was a potential target, including former members, the so-called splittees. In my very last days at Sinanon, a real sense of fear. I had the sense that the atmosphere was so volatile that had somebody given the order to a bunch of, of fanatics to uh, use physical violence on me or any other kind of dissident there, I, I was afraid. I just had those spooky, violent vibes. Spooky, violent vibes turn to more violence. That's after the break. You're listening to Chapter 3 of American Rehab from Reveal. From the Center for Investigative Reporting and PRX, this is Reveal. I'm Al Edson. When Lynn Ritter took her daughter across the country to that Synanon safe house in New York, it forced a confrontation between her husband, Phil, and the group he had just been thrown out of. Phil went to court and threatened to subpoena Synanon leader Chuck Dietrich. He wanted Chuck to answer questions under oath about Synanon's role in helping to hide his daughter. 
As reveals Ike Street's Kondaraja tells us, Sinanon didn't like that idea. I know this is a painful thing to recount, but in as much detail as you're comfortable, could you describe what happens on September 21st, 1978? Very short description. I drove into my driveway after work, had a bag of groceries in my hand, got about 10 steps from my car to the front door. Two guys came running toward me with stocking masks on that so I couldn't recognize them. They both had clubs of some sort, and they beat on me for, I don't know, until, you know, the neighbor heard me screaming and, and uh, ran them off. They beat Phil enough to fracture his skull and break his leg in a couple places. After a few days in the hospital, meningitis entered his brain, and Phil went unconscious. In the meantime... Lynn was still hiding out at that safe house in New York, where she was within earshot of Sinanon's closed-circuit radio program, The Wire. And she said, Lynn Ritter, wherever you are, your husband's been beat up and is in the hospital. And I just fell apart. It wasn't my finest hour, kidnapping my daughter and saying, too bad you got beat up and almost died. Phil was in a meningitis-induced coma for about two weeks, Pulitzer Prize-winning author Dave Mitchell of the Point Reyes Light wrote, There were many moments that brought about the end of Sinanon, but, quote, In my opinion, the pivotal one was the near-fatal beating of ex-member of Sinanon, Phil Ritter. And I just wanted to know if you agree with that. Well, I think it was one of the pivotal events. Just a few weeks later, Sinanon would strike again. This time, against a Los Angeles lawyer who had recently sued Sinanon for holding people against their will. Could you say your, your name for the record? Uh, Paul Morantz. Paul Morantz had a medical condition that makes him a little hard to hear. I met him at his home in the Pacific Palisades neighborhood of L.A. His house is a Sinanon museum. The walls are covered with framed magazine articles, newspaper clippings, and old pictures of Sinanon. Stacks of legal boxes line the walls, and they're filled with depositions, transcripts, and case files. And it's where many of the Sinanon recordings you've heard came from. And all of this, a life's work battling cults, started with one call from a concerned husband who feared that his wife was being held captive at Sinanon. Paul helped get that woman out and won a $300,000 judgment for the family. From then on, he had a reputation. Well, there's a lawyer, Paul Morantz, who will hear you out, you know. So all of a sudden, I had all these excellent on people that were coming to my door. Paul became the go-to guy for Sinanon split tees. He was known as a tough lawyer who took each case against Sinanon almost personally. Of course, what I was upset with was Sinanon's arrogance that they could believe that Anybody who lives in their community got cured by osmosis. So therefore, it was justifiable to keep anyone in there by any means for their own good. Though Paul suspected an ulterior motive. It was a way to build the workforce, labor force. All this made Paul fast enemies inside Synanon, all the way to the top of the organization. Chuck Diedrich wanted Paul dealt with. Channel 2 News first reported the existence of Diederich's suggestions in an interview with a former member. He's talking about this lawyer named uh, Paul Morantz, and he talks, uh, he's saying that somebody should fix him. I'm quite willing to break some lawyer's legs, and then tell him he's the next time to break your wife's legs. Then I'm going to cut your kid's arm off, and uh, try me, because this is only a sample. You son of a bitch, like that, and that's the end of your lawyer. That's the end. To put this militant posture in context, the year was 1978, and that was a very bad year for cults and the people in them. It was the most macabre sight any of the doctors, soldiers, and reporters had ever seen. Another group, also with headquarters in the San Francisco Bay Area, would become the symbol of cult madness. 
Reverend Jim Jones, the founder of the People's Temple, was another paranoid, authoritarian ruler who promised healing to his members, but caused a massive loss of life. The Jonestown Massacre left nearly a thousand people dead in a horrific murder-suicide in rural Guyana. It was the largest loss of American civilian life until 9-11. And it was so massive that it eclipsed Sinanon's own final dramatic turn towards violence. Our previous posture is, don't mess with us. You can get killed, physically dead. And uh, we're, we're going to react to, to all aggression toward us. Just a month before Jonestown, Paul had been on high alert, looking over his shoulder and checking under his car for bombs. But one day, he let his guard down. Open the game of the Dodger Yankee World Series. Now the starting lineup. Batting first, the center fielder, Mickey Rivers. And I wanted to just... For a moment, forget about sitting on, forget about the shotgun by my bed, and to uh, watch the game. Batting second, the left fielder, Roy White. And so I retreated back towards my bedroom and reached in my mailbox and pulled out the mail. And then um, the snake's head came out and bit me. I. Um, Dropped to the floor. A rattlesnake, four and a half feet long. Someone had slipped it through the mail flap on his house. And when Paul reached inside, it sunk its fangs into the flesh of his left wrist. going out to that back kitchen door, screaming to my neighbor, Edie, to get me ice. Call 911. Sinan got me. Sinanon pioneered drug treatment in this country, inspiring hundreds of spin-offs, and it built itself into an empire. But this would be the moment that it would be most remembered for. And then at the hospital, they said to me, are you sure it's a rattlesnake? And then all of a sudden I thought, but there was no rattles. And that made me have a moment of doubt. They told me the rattles had been removed. What do you mean the rattles had been? They cut off the rattles. So I couldn't hear it. Like screwing a silencer onto a pistol these cartoonishly diabolical assassins had silenced a venomous snake. It didn't take long to track down the would-be killers. Two members of Synanon, the controversial drug rehabilitation group, have been arrested. Synanon was once an organization that tried to help people. It appears to have changed, changed greatly. They did a sworn affidavit, which, you know, described exactly who ordered my beating, who ordered Paul Morantz's rattlesnake attack, you know, and so forth. When Phil Ritter was kicked out of Synanon for trying to stop mass vasectomies, he still believed in this communal alternative lifestyle. So much so that he drove up and down California looking for another commune to join. But... The 70s decade of experimental communities had come to an end. I missed the timing. If I had been like four or five years earlier, there were a bunch of intentional communities. But by the time I got out there looking, they had all shut down. In the chaotic aftermath of Synanon, miraculously, Lynn and Phil found each other again and reconciled. They had weathered an excommunication a near vasectomy, a kidnapping, an even near fatal attack, and found a new way to connect. We fell into the most wonderful uh, group of people in the world. We started going to Quaker Meeting. Quaker Meeting is silent worship. 
what could be different than the Sinanon game, where you're killing one another verbally, and here you are with these saintly, white-haired Quakers just trying to make your connection to your higher power. Phil and Lynn have now been married 48 years. They live close to their daughter and grandchildren. From the ridiculous to the sublime. The games were three hours. The meditation or worship session was only an hour. <laughs> Paul Morantz never quite recovered from his battle with Sinanon. He says his engagement to the love of his life couldn't weather the intensity of the threats on his life or his obsession with these cases. After the snake attack, Chuck Diedrich was put on five years probation and ordered to stop running Synanon. Paul tells me that some members hoped this would be their chance to make a new future for the group. But we never got a chance to find it out because I destroyed it. Destroyed a chance for Synanon to be reborn without Chuck Diedrich. The letter where I destroyed it is in that pink book there. Paul shows me a letter he wrote to the IRS. Investigators had already looked into the group's questionable finances, including Diedrich paying himself a $500,000 early retirement bonus. And to cover their tracks, Sinanon destroyed lots of tape recordings and records referencing violence. Paul's letter argued that destruction of evidence was enough to kill Sinanon's nonprofit status. The IRS agreed. The IRS says the foundation is not tax exempt and should not be offering tax deductions. Nine high level members are under a 21 count federal indictment for conspiracy to commit perjury, to obstruct justice, and to defraud the United States in a case linked to their efforts to retain tax exempt status. Not unlike Al Capone, it was the accountants who brought down this empire. The loss of the group's tax-exempt status meant Synanon could no longer offer write-offs in exchange for charitable donations. They also owed back taxes on those donations and for all those beautiful scenic properties, totaling $55.6 million. And even though Paul bears the emotional scars of his battle with Synanon and helped end its reign, he has awe for what it achieved. So it was utopia. Sinan came closest to utopia of perhaps anything ever before. It was utopia, but only for those at the top. It was sort of reincarnation of the early Roman days. That was, you know, the same thing. Rome was based upon slaves. And Sinanon it was accomplished with slave labor. You might say, isn't this the American dream? We have to disperse goods and make money. So if we find a method to build a better mousetrap, uh, a better drug rehab, what's wrong with that? Isn't that consistent with the values of America? We get rich by getting everyone else well. Synanon popularized the model of turning people with addictions into an unpaid workforce. But when Synanon died, the model didn't die with it. It lived on in what Paul calls the clones. As I said to you, everything that happened in Synanon is happening in the clones. What are the clones? Uh, those who are using the Sinanon mythology in which to increase their wealth. And for the same reasons. That's why I said that everything that happened in Sinanon is going to happen in those other groups for the same reasons. Greed. Sinanon was this singular giant born in a world where giants don't exist. A miracle. It touched the lives of thousands of people addicted to drugs and gave hope to more. But it grew too big, too violent, and its own corruption killed it. But it wasn't alone. It had children, direct descendants, spread to all corners of the country, and they were just coming into their own 
as Synanon had its last breath. Well, you know, I, I left in 67 after seven years and three months. Candy Latson took what he learned at Synanon and spread the gospel. Along with other ex-members, he helped build a new Synanon-inspired drug rehab in New York. This new rehab, like so many others, took the Synanon model of treatment and tried to leave the snakes at the door. All the people that was leaving Synanon got jobs at Phoenix House. They didn't have no skills. They didn't have no degrees. But they knew how to work in a program. Phoenix House is still around today. It has 97 drug rehab programs across 10 states. Then there was a place called CEDU, that's C-E-D University. Incidentally, C-E-D happened to be the initials of Charles E. Diedrich. And that's where John Stallone went after he left Synanon. They went to work for that program CEDU. The guy hires me, the guy says, yeah, yeah, we want you to work here. So he was like an old game player, but he started a program himself. That wasn't the only spinoff John worked for. Don't forget, the other place I played the game, uh, that really played the game, was Amity. Amity in Arizona. Amity, Phoenix House, Delancey, Daytop. The list of former Synanon members who went on to start or work at Synanon-inspired rehabs is long and reaches across the country. And that's not even counting the entire other universe of teen scared straight programs that Synanon also inspired. By one researcher's count, in the 70s, there were 500 rehabs in the United States that descended from Synanon. Now, the National Institutes of Health says it's spread to more than 65 different countries around the world. And so many of them help people in need and save lives. But some also have the original sin of Synanon in their DNA. One way I've always thought of, of, of Synanon is, is, a, is an American money-making concern. It's a business. The business of turning rehab participants into an unpaid workforce was too tempting for some spinoffs. And that includes one place that was founded by a guy that Candy Latson actually met way back in the early 60s. I asked Candy if there was any chance he might remember a guy named Luke. I got something to share with you. I don't know how this happened. I was getting ready to go to bed last night, and it was like something that had been repressed in me floated up from my unconscious mind to my conscious mind. What it was, it was about Luke. Luke was an inmate in Nevada State Prison, where Candy Latson had been coming to teach the Synanon method. He taught Luke how to play the game, and in return, Luke would sing Candy old cowboy songs. Yeah, inside of Nevada State Prison, he wore cowboy boots and dressed like a cowboy and combed his hair like a cowboy and talked like a fucking cowboy. And you wouldn't fuck with him because he, he, wasn't, he, he wasn't scared of nobody. So nobody bothered him. Everybody wanted Luke to sing. Luke Austin, the tall, red-headed cowboy, would eventually move on from the Synanon program and start his own program based on the Synanon method. It grew into one of the biggest work-based rehabs in the country. And I started thinking like, God damn, I ain't thought about that boy in years. And, 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 and I could see him with cowboy boots on, jeans, red hair, guitar. And he triggered something in me. I had so many more questions about this game-playing cowboy, but I never got to ask Candy. This winter, before we were supposed to talk again, Candy passed away. Candy, in so many ways, embodied the best spirit of Synanon. He turned his life around there, became one of the most amazing storytellers I've ever heard. Funny and raw and no subject was off limits. His life also reminds me of the shortcomings of Synanon. After years living and teaching Synanon's methods, he relapsed 
hard and for years was homeless in L.A. Eventually, it was John Stallone who helped get Candy back into a rehab program. After that, Candy started going to meetings, AA, NA, and helped other guys going through the same thing. He kept that up until he passed away. Candy was 83 years old. For much of his life, he taught Synanon's methods to others, including that cowboy named Luke Austin. The punishments, the game, the work without pay, they all live on today. They live on at a rehab that Luke founded, the rehab that we're investigating, Senecor. I was told that you would help me find a job. I wasn't told that I'd be just thrown into a van and hauled off to some job and, I, and be told that I, I like it or not. I have to do it. Next time on American Rehab, the secret origin story of Senecor and the con man who cooked it up. I stayed at Senecor 11 years. 11 years. I stayed there under a, a dictator <laughs> named Luke Austin. That's coming next week. American Rehab is reported and produced by Shoshana Walter, Laura Starcheski, and Ike Shreese Kandaraja. Brett Myers is our editor. This chapter was reported and produced by Ike. Laura is our lead producer. Now, if you are enjoying the series, please do us a favor. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps spread the word about our show. And while you're there, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss the next episode. Amy Julia Harris helped us report the story from the beginning and launch this project. We had additional editorial help from Narda Zucchino, Andy Donahue, and Esther Kaplan. Production support from WHYY in Philadelphia. Research help from Claire Clark and David Hertzberg. Fact-checking by Rosemary Ho. Victoria Baronetsky is our general counsel. Our production manager is Mwende Inahosa. Our production team includes Najib Amini, Catherine Miskowski, and Amy Mustafa. Our theme song, Lifeline, is by the dynamic duo, Jay Breezy, Mr. Jim Briggs, and Fernando, my man, Yo Aruda. They composed and performed all the music for American Rehab, and stick around for the full song after we finish the credits. Our CEO is Krista Scharfenberg. Matt Thompson is our editor-in-chief. Our executive producer is Kevin Sullivan. Support for Reveals provided by the Reeve and David Logan Foundation, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Jonathan Logan Family Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the Heising Simons Foundation, the Democracy Fund, and the Ethics and Excellence in Journalism Foundation. Reveal is a co-production of the Center for Investigative Reporting and PRX. I'm Al Letson. And remember, there is always more to the story.
Rx.